You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane. We're here talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona, and it is Beautiful. Oh my gosh. This is the this is what fall is all about. This is why we live in northern Arizona. It's just been so beautiful. You know, you thought winter was here and then all of a sudden it's nice again. We call that Indian summers or or you remember back last spring. You thought it was warm, thought it was warm, thought it was warm, and then it got cold. And then it warmed back up. And it was like the, it was like this violent warm then cold, warm then cold, and, and the temperature would swing like 40 degrees between daytime and nighttime. And, and that's why the frost date, the last frost date of spring at most of the elevations is going to be that first week in May. You hire elevation folks and Flagstaff and Pine Top Lakeside and, and uh, Williams, you're, you're going to be probably the end of May. You folks down the lower elevations, Cottonwood, Camp Verde, Sedona, Kingman, you're probably down towards the uh, end of April. But basically, if you took Mother's Day, plus or minus a couple of weeks on either side, that's our last frost. It seems like in March we could we it's we get tricked into wanting to plant too early our summer blooming things. And so they get zipped. The fruit trees get tricked into blooming too early and then they get zipped. The, the fruit is taken. Especially if you're if you're planting the wrong varieties for the mountains. So if you're planting a desert variety, let's say you go to your big box store or big big cost go price club thing and 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 they've got these fruit trees out in front and they're so tempting because they're like 50 bucks oh that's a great deal uh they're the wrong variety many many times they'll grow but they'll never bloom and fruit and so that that's why timing is 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 important and then also the variety is important Right now, we're into the fall blooming things. I thought I would cover some of the things that should be planted right now, things that are best planted in the fall. Right now, if you see basil, if you see a cilantro uh, at your grocery store and it goes, here, here's, take this home and, and, and plant it, it will not grow outdoors from this point forward. It'll, you'll put it out there within a week, dead. They're made for indoors or in tropical landscapes or, or interior landscapes. They're made for house, house plants, kitchen seal things. I've even struggled growing basil in my windowsill because if it touches that cold glass in January and February, it, it does not like that. If you close a curtain down in front of it and it's between the pane and, and that, and that curtain, it will, it gets too cold there. It'll just keel over and die. And so they're made to be where it's warm. Right now, you can plant rosemary. You can plant lavender. You, thyme, oregano. It's a whole series. Chives, garlics. There's a whole series of plants that, that love to be planted now. Your best parsley crop will be planted now through, oh, the end of November or so. Your best uh, lettuce, spinach, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, they're all planted now, and you're harvesting those for Thanksgiving dinner, for Christmas dinner, and they'll keep blooming or producing, or you can harvest right through winter. I would say if you're into kale, healthy, you know, there's no more antioxidants than what's in a kale or beets. Those are best planted now. So you get, we've got four seasons. The big mistake many people make when planting is they'll take that last cool season crop in May. We've got our last frost. It's only going to get nothing but warmer. We quickly go from 70s, beautiful, everyone's celebrating the spring season, to 90. It's just hot in the mountains. And, and those spring-blooming things don't like that. Equally, if you go plant right now, the summer-loving things, things that love the heat, well, the heat's pretty much gone at this point. Yes, it's nice days, but there's a chill in the evening, and it comes down to nighttime temperatures for most of these plants. And so this is when you do want to plant your cool season things. Let's talk flowers. Your, your pansies love the cold. 
That's one of the biggest mistakes. A lot of folks think their thumbs are, are, are black because they mistimed or misjudged when to plant that crop of, of pansies. And so it, it quickly, it just falls over dead in the heat. If it's above 85 degrees, pansies, they're not happy. And there's no amount of water or shade you can give them work to keep them alive. They love to be planted. Now, the only thing that would be better if, if we were to plant in about three weeks, we get a light snow right on top of them. Thanksgiving, they would absolutely celebrate that. Some plants like the cold. Snapdragons are that way. Dusty Miller are that way. Violas, uh, ornamental kale. There's actually edible kale, which is very sweet, very delicious. My mouth's just watering, thinking about like Lisa actually sprinkles, uh, she makes a soup de scato with freshly cut up kale that's so good in a soup. Oh, it's so good. Um, and then there's ornamental kale. It's just meant to be pretty. And they're typically reds and purples and whites. They're just gorgeous. And of course, the most famous of all of the fall perennials, mums or chrysanthemums. They love to be grown. They love to be planted now. And they'll keep coming back every year, bigger and bigger and bigger. So my mums, I planted as a four inch or gallon, I forget. And now they're, they've got to be... <laughs> They've got to be two feet across. They're glorious. They've set, they blossomed twice. They bloomed late summer and now they're blooming again. So that's just really what you want to see out of those perennials. But it's about the timing. Sometimes it's not you that has the garden issue. Sometimes it's the nursery, your, your, the advice you're getting and the timing. You're getting the wrong variety or you're planting the right variety at the wrong time and it, and it doesn't succeed or it fails or it struggles. And you're wondering, oh, what did I do wrong? It wasn't you. It was, it was you were sold the wrong bill of goods, basically. So that's why we're so big here at least our garden center of, of garden information. So this is our 57th year of being open. Uh, 57 seasons. I mean, 57 years. We started in 1962. Is, did I do the math right? I'm pretty sure. Um, that uh, and, and, and our formula has always been be friendly, be neighborly. And, and neighbors, we're just, we're leaning across the fence. We're just sharing the advice that's really worked in our backyard. And if you do these things, it will also work for you in your backyard. And, and if you teach someone how to garden, they'll get the, they'll catch that bug and then want to do it more. And if they're really good at it, they'll start to tell it to their friends. And now, now we've got the next neighbor leaning against the fence and sharing it with their, with their neighbors. And so gardening is very social that way. And so it's all about getting that timing right. So right now, this is a tremendous time to be planting those fall perennials. Even if they're starting to fade, let's say the hostas are out there right now. Hostas are a great big root, basically. It's, it's, a, it's a fleshy root. And so this beautiful soft foliage comes up. It's a shade plant in the mountains of Arizona with a very fragrant white flower. Uh, they, they just sit there and they hibernate. The beautiful thing right now is they are a true perennial. Their green foliage was, will start to turn brown, kind of a gold color, kind of a little lighter than, than aspen gold, not a butter yellow, but kind of a bright gold color. And as it fades, as it starts to shrivel back and then, then start to turn brown, uh, it'll just hibernate. But while it's doing that, there's tremendous root growth that happens underneath that. And so hostas tend to be kind of wimpy in a more sunny area. If you plant them now, they root out through the end of the year. They'll root out again. They'll extend those same roots even farther. And so by the time you get to next summer's 80, 90 degree weather, in the mountains at least, they are going to be much hardier than if you were to wait and plant those in May, where they really haven't had any time to root they're, they're, we're coming into summer and then they struggle some. They get brown tips. There's a real advantage to fall planting. If you can find the fall perennials, mums are that way. I would say crococmia. There's a beautiful, like an iris looking grass has this fluorescent orange flower. It's from summer. They've been in bloom for two, two and a half months. It's cra crazy long bloom cycle. They are a true perennial. They will die back to the ground. You'll just weed whack them or mow them off, and then they'll keep rooting under the ground. Then you'll get more roots next spring, and then you'll have a much tougher 
plant, much larger plant, many more flowers next spring. And there's a real advantage to fall to fall planting over summer or spring planting. A lot of advice at this show. Be right back. Lisa Watersland is coming in with your garden questions right after this. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Coral Queen Kale. This unusual plant has deeply serrated foliage with deep green outer leaves and a very dark crimson center. She is definitely the queen of the autumn garden. This crop has huge feathery leaves that form large heads the size of beach balls. Very, very pretty and all for under $10. Waters Garden Center, the place for people who love very pretty plants. They love to shop. You know how to find us. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and her Ivory Feathers Pampas Grass. The most majestic of all grasses, this dwarf variety grows only five feet, making it easier to care for. In feathery bloom now, with long ivory plumes held tall above the flowing green foliage. At $39, this perfect pampas grass is ready for fall planting, while supplies last. Only grown here at Waters Garden Center, the place where people who love ivory feathered grasses, they love to shop. You know where to find us. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. And welcome into the studio, Lisa. Hi. So... This week, I mean, we've had yes. great response from Ponderosa Circle. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, it's frightening how few customers actually keep a small business going. <laughs> when you really look at the numbers, yeah. it's like the biggest of the small companies, maybe a hundred families keep the, keep the thing going. Yeah, it takes all. We have, we'll have 35,000 customers come through mm-hmm. the garden center here at, at the but usually those are once and done. But there's like a core that is here like every week. They like they know your kids' names. They bring your kids' birthday presents. They bring they bake cookies. They say thank you a lot. And so mm-hmm. we have what's called our Ponderosa Circle. We invite those folks that you can actually name. You know who they are. We have a party just for them. Just, we just do. A, and then we I treat them kind of like the board of directors and we we I tell them what's gonna happen next year and what they've seen, how we've done. And so I think there's, we're hold, held accountable to them mm-hmm. and they, they support us. They're also the word of mouth, the people that, that talk about you nonstop yeah. to their friends. They're fun. Nice, nice group of people. And we always have fun at that event. And the thing that I love about it the most, I think, is because we kind of set the chairs up in circles and gardeners love other gardeners and they get That's to true. talking <laughs> and it's just fun because they have something in common that they're relating to and enjoying. So yeah. it's, it's not water's garden center. It's, it's gardening mm-hmm. is their thing that they connect. And we just happen to be a conduit that right. celebrates that and yeah. we promote gardening. So mm-hmm. I had a story, uh, one gentleman sharing out uh, in one of the groups, uh-huh. he goes, Ken, I just love your plants. He goes on and on and on in front of everyone. I'm going, thank you very much. I love your support. Thank you. He goes, oh, I just had a party at our house. And I was showing off my trees you guys just planted. And they, he had to show off the trees he got from Waters. And the crew planted it from Waters. And <laughs> here's my plants. And isn't it so nice as he's having this backyard thing? Right. I mean, that's yeah. what your core, core, core right. folks have. Some folks are just, mm-hmm. give me my plants. I went out of here. Can you, can you give me five bucks off? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, but thank you very much. And these folks go. I, I, just, I want looking for ways to support. So mm-hmm. thank you very much, all of you that that uh, came. But uh, this is about gardening, right? Or yes, it Q&A is. Q and A questions. Questions. We should slip some of those in. You bet. Well, Rob in Prescott, he has a 15 year old blue spruce. It's showing a lot of yellow inside <laughs> and towards the bottom yeah. right now. And he wants to know, is that normal for this time of year? Or is there something else he should be looking for? Yes and yes. Uh-huh. And yes. So we're getting this. There's a wave of customers coming in with yellowing of their conifers. Not just spruce. 
also pine mm-hmm. for cedars, uh, a little bit of junipers, but mainly it's those needled evergreens. That's called a conifer. Uh, if you're still watering them right now, like they were back s- last summer, uh, you're, you're more than likely over watering. So that's yellow needles on the inside or towards the top is, is almost always over watering. Oh, but can I, I'm sure it's not that for the last 15 years, I've been watering the same. I've heard every angle from this. It's always denial, but almost guaranteed it's cooled off. It really cooled off last week. And the plants shut down. Mm -hmm. And if you're still watering, they've had two weeks now straight of overwatering. And so they're letting you, they're communicating. Hey, hey, did you wake up? I'm, I'm, I'm stressed here. So they shed some needles. The other one could be too. It's normal for conifers to shed some needles this time of year. The proof is in the ponderosas. Mm -hmm. You'll see uh, ponderosa trees, your pinion pine trees. The natives, they just are shedding some things. I notice our juniper in the backyard is doing the same thing. Mm As that bark, as they shut down, they bring all the carbohydrates, the, the starches, back into the structure of the plant. They make a there's tremendous root growth and tremendous ring growth right now. And so, as that bark thickens, as the needles uh, they, they get shaded towards the inside, the inside of that trunk, it's not unusual to have needles drop. It's very very common. In fact, it's normal for a conifer. Uh, pines and spruce and things that are evergreens to drop this time of year. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason. This is your time when they're kind of messy. They drop, they aren't, they're evergreen, but they also shed some of those needles that they had from last year and the year before. Mm-hmm. So generally on the inside. Right. Did we get all that? I think so. What what I would tell people or encourage people, if somebody comes along and tells you, oh, that's a, that's a blight, that's a fungus, yeah. <laughs> that's a something, don't, believe them and and don't start you know letting them do crazy things to your trees because yeah. i agree with you i think it's just in, environmental and the time of year and just kind of some what they do so yeah it's not i mean blight is so unusual for mm-hmm. an evergreen to get a blight or a di- fungal disease right. that's more for leafy things and vegetables mm-hmm. and flowers they'll get a leaf spot that kind of stuff your, your uh, conifers get more insects. Sometimes there's a bark beetle or ips head, uh, beetle or flathead boar. There's some things that can get, go through the bark and, and eat them, but it's not a leaf spotting kind of thing. Right. That's usually, almost always, a watering issue, either mm-hmm. over or underwater. And with evergreens, because they're so tough in the mountains of Arizona, more than likely it's overwatering. Yeah. We no. just covered 80% of all issues overwatering. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> if it was always that simple, but yeah. 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 So are you recommending just kind of make sure they've gotten their fall food? Oh, uh, how to cut what back to, on the watering. Sure. And, if you want to keep them healthy, food is, is tremendous. The seven, four, four, all purpose organic. That the evergreens love that it'll keep them green. It'll help set the stage for next year's bud growth. Oh yeah. That's probably the best thing you can do for them mm-hmm. right now. Okay. Our next question is from Michelle in Prescott Valley. Her day lilies are now just looking pretty spent. Yeah. Uh, she wants to know, is it too early to trim them back? Yeah, um, yes, too early. I would say like with some of ours, I pruned back the spent flower heads because they look, they aren't blooming. They're done. They're starting to shut down, but they're still green. I, as long as they've got green foliage, I would leave the green foliage because it can create photosynthesis, which uh, takes all that starch that they, they create. It'll form next year's flower from the green foliage let it go through that natural process don't cut them back until they're brown this is all perennials till they're brown clean them up uh, you take some of the dead flowers if it's driving you crazy or, or tr- prune back the edges so they're not as droopy but i would keep most of that green foliage for another month month and a half till the end of the year and by then for sure we're done with this fall weather we're into winter cut them back take a mower to them weed whack them it doesn't matter <laughs> Uh, but let them do their thing naturally through fall. Don't don't encourage. Don't don't rush things. Mm-hmm. I noticed some of our salvia gray eyes up by the road. They're just looking kind of. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, eh, we could just trim those back a little bit. Yeah, I've trimmed them back okay. once or twice already, mm-hmm. and then fertilized them. That's why the show has been so incredible. I actually think they're worn out. <laughs> they're just tired of blooming so much, mm-hmm. and they're waiting. They want. 
fall. But I'll leave that foliage on the salvias until yeah. winter, till the harshest of winter is over, because mm-hmm. that that foliage will actually protect the core, the heart, the core of that right. plant and keep them healthy. Sure. Okay. So don't be impatient. Don't, don't rush it. Okay. The folks from Palm Springs, from Southern Cal, Phoenix, Tucson, they're in such a rush. Like I always had everything done by the end of December. Well, here we wait until really mm-hmm. February, March before we really clean up and and hedge and trim things. Okay. Uh, Sarah from Chino says, it seems like I still have a huge number of grasshoppers. Yeah. Is it worth doing something about them right now or just wait till next you, year? Yes, do something. They're laying eggs like crazy. Don't let them do that till you kill them off. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, this is serious, especially in Chino, Paulden, that whole valley from Cortis Junction all the way up that valley. It's just terrible. So they grow the size of like squirrels. I mean, they're <laughs> huge. And so they've got a ferocious appetite right now. Uh, but the only way to really kill them is to spray them. There's a spray here at the garden center. So they're close enough from Chino to, mm-hmm. to come in. And we've got a product called multi-purpose insect spray. Put it in a hose in sprayer, hose down the, a barrier around your gardens. If you hit them, they'll die. And then also if they eat things, they'll die. And then it'll keep, it'll repel them back. And so they're less likely to lay as many eggs in your yard. They'll lay more eggs out in your neighbor's yard. That's the goal. Keep them over there. Mm-hmm. Don't let them in. So next right. spring, late spring, early summer, about mm, June. Come in and get some bait. We've got an organic bait you can spread around. That'll really knock them back. But for now, that doesn't work. They're too mature. They're too aggressive. Uh, Spray them with that multi-purpose insect spray, and they will. You'll see dead carcasses all over the gardens the next day. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners will be right back with more garden tips, tricks, and garden advice. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Red Wall Creeping Vine. It's said good fences make good neighbors, but fences can be downright ugly. This rich green climber is turning fire engine red through October with blue accent fruit. It's really pretty. And very fast growing. And when planted at eight foot intervals, covers a boring fence within a season, all for just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love good neighbors, they love to shop. Hi, Ken, with the Plants of the Week and our Cheyenne Spirit Coneflower. This new native is an exclusive wildflower sure to delight and inspire. The flowers change from purples to orange, then fade into a Cheyenne sunset. Leave some of the seed heads so that it spreads throughout the garden, adds winter beauty that also feeds the birds through winter, in just $17. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love exclusive flowers, they love to shop. Listening to the Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. I've got to tell you, there's something really exciting going on in Prescott here, at least. There's a, there's a lot going on in the mountains. I mean, there's a lot of gardening stuff going on. That's very exciting. We will have those guest speakers on from seed saving to this one happens to be a make100healthy.org. It's a new foundation starting out. They want to get people back into the gardens eating fresh from your own backyard. And then that creates longevity, uh, healthiness. Uh, it's, just, it's just better. It teaches the next generation. And they're having, they want to plant a million gardens public gardens throughout the U.S. Uh, within, I forget the time frame. That's quite ambitious. They've got their very first garden starting right here in Prescott. Prescott Lakes is going to plant their first garden. They've got a big gala coming up that uh, if even if you're not in Prescott Lakes, I think the whole community within the area is invited. But it's a Make 100 Healthy Foundation Gala charity event November 12th. It will be at the Prescott Lakes Clubhouse. From 5.30 to 8. That's November 12th, 5.30 good friend of mine, John Murphy, is going to has started this. A legendary gardener. I mean, globally, he, he works here, has been a gardener locally for 
decades, but then travels globally to help third world countries farm better. Uh, Daniel Blake will be sharing his guard advice, his story during that. And then Dr. Stephen Brown, uh, complex medicine, simple wisdom. He's just going over how to get longer, better life. So you've got a doctor, a hardcore, I mean, like not just gardener, farmer. And then uh, the foundation is going to be presenting this 530 to 8 from November 12th. Uh, see, I think that's a Monday. That might even be Veterans Day. I, could, I should check on that. Hold on here. Let's see. Pulling up my calendar. How fast? Can we? Yeah, Veterans Day. Right on. Veterans Day at 530 Prescott Lakes. Uh, take a look at that. I think you can get more at uh, probably Make 100 Healthy. Found, what is that? Make100healthy.com, I'm sh- pretty sure. So, or I'll try to post this online on our Facebook page or something so it's easy to reference. So that's exciting to see what ambitious goals. It's always impressive. When I'm worked out, I'm just tired. I've had too much of the business part of the family business and not enough gardening, which is my passion. I love talking to gardeners. I'll just go out and decompress and chit-chat with gardeners about their gardens and what's going on in the landscape. And, And I get to hear their stories, and it is fascinating what people have done with their lives. It's just amazing. And continue to go for, uh, continue to do in their lives. Anyway, take a look at that. November 12th, make 100 healthy.com. Uh, just because it's a friend and I, I like to promote gardening a million gardens. That's impressive. So that's what's going on there. One thing also to uh, make sure that the best thing you can do for your garden, if we're talking edibles, if you've had a plant, like I just pulled a pumpkin that I harvested the pumpkins, giant pumpkins are each weighing 40, 50 pounds are pretty big. They're pretty impressive. Pulled them out and I saw some powdery mildew and snails and slugs underneath all of that foliage. It's important as you start to clean up, dig up, transfer, as the plants start to fade, especially your annual flowers and your annual vegetables. These would be things like tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, pumpkins, of course, uh, th- those things that you're picking the fruit off of. If it was diseased at all, if it was struggling at all, if you had holes, if there's anything wrong, don't compost that. Get it out of your yard. You don't want that coming back next year and infecting the next crop in your sm- square foot gardening. That's a big reason why we tend to rotate crops. So you don't put potatoes in the same spot every year. You don't put tomatoes or beets or lettuce in the same spot every year. You want to rotate and put them in different spots in the yard. So for me, I do a a raised bed. It's maybe 120 square feet. And then quite a number of container pots. I probably have another... 40, 50 feet, square feet of of container garden space. And so what I'll do is I'll take my container garden plants, this year it was tomatoes, and I'll put my tomato crop next year into my raised bed uh, crop. Uh, Last year, this this year I had squash in the raised bed. I'll put those in my container. So I'm always rotating my crops. So if I happen to miss some powdery mildew spores or some sort of virus, it got vertinillum wilt on my tomatoes, um, I don't. I, I don't want that to stay in my yard. I don't compost those. I'll throw them away. I'll let the city trash take them away, and then I'll try to rotate crops and I'll add some fresh soil to my gardens every year. That little trick seems to really be a a game changer as far as reducing the amount of of issues I have that carry over from year to year. I would say that for your roses. I'd say that if you saw. Uh, some sort of disease on your petunias. I had a couple petunias that were glorious. They faded. I don't know if it was the cold that got the foliage last week because they're they're a, they're a tropical plant. They don't like cold, or if they just faded all of a sudden because of disease. Either way, I pulled them out this this week, threw them in the trash because I wasn't sure and I didn't want to take the time to figure it out. And I planted my pansies because pansies they won't transfer from pansy to petunia. It'll transfer petunia to petunia. Those are just some insider tricks to help you clean up, maintain, and keep the color going, keep the harvest going throughout the end of the year. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. 
Hi, Ken, with the Plants of the Week and our Fire Alarm, Red Mums. With a name like Fire Alarm, you'd expect large red blooms that take a fire hose to put the glowing petals out. Just provide a little garden soil for a flaming red that will last and last. But wait, there's more. This Fire Alarm Mum comes back again for even bigger show next year and just $3.99. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love red mums, they love to shop. Hi, Waters with the Plants of the Week and our Regal Petticoat Maple. If you love maples but want superior leaf color, then this is your shade tree. Regal maple leaves are glossy green on top with a velvety purple underside. Through autumn, the petticoat leaves turn gold on top and red on the bottom side. I mean, wow! This is a great shade tree for just $99. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love Regal maples, they love to shop. All right, we have Lisa Waters Lane back in the studio just to share her opinions. <laughs> of which life. I have many. Yeah, or garden advice. Oh, okay. Preferably go down the garden sure, path. narrow it down. <laughs> so anyway, welcome back to the studio. Glad to get that uh, uh, a different gardener's perspective on the garden. I think there's as, as many gardens out there as there are gardeners. And so oh, each yeah. each one has... And each individual's personality in their gardens, whether it's sterile and stark and organized or wild and free and just uh, colorful or butterflies everywhere. Just everyone's got their own thing that makes them happy. Oh, yeah. And that's that's a good style. That's what that's what you should do. If it, you don't read a book and go, it has to be this way. It has to be your way. I mean, yeah, there's some garden principles that really help. But to our gardens, the front yard is definitely your thumbprint hard, hardcore yes. and so people walk by and go oh, your yard's so pretty we do a lot of flowers out front so mm-hmm. a lot of color and today i noticed walking my dogs and i went down a spot that i never really go down but we were avoiding another dog so there wouldn't be a rumble <laughs> and i thought i did a lot of color in front there was a house uh, it was just beautiful yeah a um, lot of mums, just really pretty fall color that they had done, and I was impressed. You know, that, that kind of gardening, it spreads, it's contagious. So you'll notice that when one neighbor starts, you, there's like a depressed, like like nothing but like homeless live on this street. <laughs> one neighbor starts to garden and cut down the weeds, start mm-hmm. to organize, and, and then it inspires someone else, and they start talking, and then the whole, you know, three years yeah. later, the whole street's like on, on a garden tour, right? which is right. what our street is yeah. kind of at. Our street yeah. is on the garden tour pretty often, mm-hmm. or the art tour. Right. It's kind of fun. It is fun. It's nice to be in neighborhoods where people do care. And I mean, I get it. Not everybody's into gardening, but it's pretty simple just to have some color out front yeah. and do some easy things. But. I, I can tell you that we had a new bed delivered at our house. Mm-hmm. The guys that are delivering, these are hardcore, like burly men. We, we deliver furniture. <laughs> they walk by and go, I love those legs. <laughs> <laughs> She's got. It's you should like, explain that. It's like the wicked witch. They weren't of the, talking to you. No, <laughs> it was like the wicked witch of the west, face planted one of her pot, pots, and all that's left are the striped orange and black stockings with like witch feet right. buckles and everything coming out. So all you see are legs sticking out of her pots. It looks mm-hmm. like she. Uh, it's just hilarious. It's, it's fun. Funny. It's our. It's our it's fun. Halloween. It's our one Halloween decoration <laughs> we have. We're not into Halloween that much. We're into fall. No, fall. More Thanksgiving, definitely mm-hmm. Christmas, but Halloween's kind of like, eh, if we got to feed the kids, okay. Yeah, that just encourages the kids to come. No, no, go on, <laughs> grandkids, always wanting that candy. No, just, we are we are not that curmudgeon No, we're not. We're, not also, we're also not the uh, full of a candy bar no. at the house either. So Too many kids come We're by. generous, but not that much. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. Well, this week, I thought I would share my opinions on, so you put out a fall to do list, yeah. and it's a great That's list, great. and you do it every year. Well, I like to add on a few things because yours are kind of big; they're garden, big yard kind of things. They're man; they're like man lists, Arr. like sharpen the mower, right. and, uh, <laughs> spread the fertilizer. <laughs> so my list is more maybe for the, especially for the container gardeners, vegetable gardeners, and that kind of thing. So my number one is, and I get this every year, if you've put together a really pretty pot or you had a flower that you just thought was fabulous, save that tag or take a picture. Oh, that's good advice. Because you think you'll remember it. Yeah. 
<laughs> but next year you'll come in, you go, I had this plant. It had green leaves and I think it was a pink blossom. And I'm like, well, okay, we narrowed it down to 10,000 plants now. So even just taking a picture, save the tag can save you so much trouble next year if you want to look for the same type of garden plant. journals mm-hmm. i mean a garden journal is a great thing and there's digital journals as well oh, yeah. as handwritten old-fashioned journals mm-hmm. they're both good to help you remember because you won't you won't remember the right. same thing for the failures something mm-hmm. didn't quite work right. just remember what that is and don't do it again right so, or get a different variety mm-hmm. and same if you have so you put together a, a color bowl combination that you just thought was fabulous take a picture of it yeah. So that you can kind of recreate it next year and do the same thing. If you didn't like it, maybe you should take a picture of it too and go, oh, yeah, I tried that. <laughs> Don't do that again. I would say if folks can 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 have more descriptive uh, verbs or adverbs than, than just uh, it was green, it had flowers, can you tell me what it is? Yeah. Which we get all the time. Oh, a do. picture. We can ID it in a flash with just a picture. I mean, mm-hmm. cell phone. Just mm-hmm. zoom, we can zoom in, take a look, go, oh, yeah, here it is. There's a whole flat of them. Right. Yeah, usually we're pretty good at that. So number two is label your perennials. So if you have a perennial mm-hmm. bed, perennial garden, especially if you've put new ones in, because they tend to be a little on the smaller side, put a little label there, tag it somehow so that you know, you remember, oh, yeah, that was my perennial. Uh, because a lot of times when they start coming up in the spring, it's hard to tell a perennial from a weed. Yeah, it's true. And I don't know how many people have come in and go, oh, my gardener ripped out all yeah. my perennials, you know. So it's just a good idea just to label them. And that way you can kind of remember what they are as well. Popsicle sticks. Mm-hmm. I use irrigation flags and a right. Sharpie. Just anything is kind of pop it in there so you remember, oh, there's my, or color of iris or color of right. echinacea or color. It'll remember, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, the purple ones were there and the yellow ones are here. And you just mm-hmm. remember. Yeah. Definitely handy. Number three is if you did a vegetable garden or veggies in pots, make notes. Did you like, if it was a new variety for you, did you like the flavor? Did you like the texture? Did it produce a lot or only a little bit? Um, It's really a good idea just to kind of write those notes down so you know what to do or not do the following year. Um, A lot of people, you know, they get used to growing one variety, but then they try something different. But there again, they can't remember (laughs) which one they had. So just a few notes, especially with veggie gardens, because they're coming out with so many new varieties. And it's not just the same old early girl anymore. 10% of your garden should be for dedicated just to new things, whether it's flower or vegetables or whatever. And, And sometimes you get a flop. And sometimes you're going, this is the best thing ever. I have to remember this. And those are the ones that had that like black creme tomato. You, you'll never remember that unless you write it down. Yeah. Uh, green German. You'll never remember <laughs> German tomato th- 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 unless you write it down. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So taking those notes. Uh, next one is redo your annual pots. If you've got those pots that are sitting there, our sweet potato vine just looked hideous. Uh, so we just freshened them. We got rid of all the stuff that was looking bad, and we got our uh, pansies and our violas and mums and Dusty Miller, and we redid our pots. So our front yard looks fresh again. Got to keep up with the neighbors. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> color. I got some competition now. I, I can say that the the extra capacity in the city trash can <laughs> is always topped off with whatever looks bad in the yard just the annuals mm-hmm. that are fading or trimming giving things a haircut we just top it off go okay that's mm-hmm. enough for this week right. da, 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 da. Yeah. keep going so that kind of brings me to my next one is take an honest look at your yard if you have a shrub that just has got the uglies and you've just <laughs> never been happy with it pull it out now because and then gets you can it's a wonderful time to plant. You can still put new shrubs in and trees in, and it'll be wonderful. But if you wait till next spring, you know what you're going to do. No, yeah, keep it going again. Keep I'll, it going. Maybe it will be good this right. year. It's been it, five it's years. It's leafy now. And I'll give it a chance. <laughs> yeah. You know, just take a real honest look. And we do that frequently. We will pull things out that we thought oh, they'll look good there, but didn't work for one reason or another. So keeping your yard spiffy and just getting rid of the uglies. And and again, 10%. You should have 10% new stuff in your yard each year. So about every 10 years, you're redoing your yard. So you always have something fresh. You've got freshness, something sparkling there in the yard. Not the old crusty, you know, juniper hedge that needs to be whacked back like 10 years ago. 
It's, it looks, there's always something that looks good. Right. And so after you've done all those steps, you can fix yourself a, a cup of hot tea and oh. <laughs> sit out and enjoy the beautiful fall days and, and wait for winter to come. It is certainly nice right now. This yeah. is classic Arizona. Mm-hmm. It's cold one week and then it's nice and warm and it will do this through the end of the year. Right. It's very nice. It pulsates. Beautiful weather. Actually, mm-hmm. it does that right through winter. I mean, you it have does. a blizzard condition in January and... The next week, it's it's a light jacket, and you're out there. Where'd all the snow go? Yep. Not, I'm not talking about Flagstaff, or the White Mountains, <laughs> or Williams. I'm talking about the right. rest of us, yeah. so that live in uh, tempered, more tempered climates. Well, thank you, Lisa, and her garden advice. We'll be right back with more tips, tricks, and garden advice. Don't change that dial. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Sizzlin' Summer Daisy. This snow-white daisy is a natural in the summer garden when tall, white flowers are desired. Highbrow enough to use in estate settings or amassed into formal beds surrounded by boxwood for under $12. In entertainment areas, this sizzler literally leaps up under a full moon. Easy to grow and prefers planting during the monsoon. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love summer daisies love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our fragrant Low Sumac. The cute foliage is fragrant when brushed against and utterly detestable to wildlife of all kinds. A knee-high native that takes any abuse loves wind, blistering hot sun, and rocky hillsides. At $39, this hardy shrub is ideal for owners of investment and commercial rentals. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love native sumac, they love to shop. You're really starting to hit the peak of the fall color season right throughout the whole whole region uh we're we're hitting it right on so it it really looks good right now especially in that six to five thousand foot level you folks in the higher elevations have been you know the groom creeks and the the highland pines you've been in there for for probably a couple weeks already we're just now hitting the stride at the little bit lower elevations and you folks at that you know 3,500 to 5,000 foot level, you'll be a couple weeks after us. So it just has this pulsating wave depending on your elevation. And also, notice your neighborhood. Much of my neighborhood, the house is at 5,700 feet. Uh, there, it's a very hilly neighborhood. It's Eagle Ridge. So there's you probably go from 6,000 to there's probably a 500 foot elevation change between the highest hill uh, uh, house and the lowest. What you'll find is those folks that are on the south facing hills they're warmer and so the plants are a little slower to turn color those plants those houses that are on the north facing north side they're a little bit cooler more shaded and so those trees those shrubs they'll start to pop they'll start to turn color faster sooner that's also an elevation change if you're near a wash a dry wash all that cold air in the evening settles and runs down that dry wash so those plants planted closer to that low spot in the landscape they'll they'll be chilled they'll turn uh, color sooner so you'll see the same plant in the same neighborhood turning at different weeks now maybe i don't know seven to ten days difference between when the first one goes and the last one and so my maple maples have been beautiful in our neighborhood they've been in full red i'm kind of jealous going when is my maple gonna turn color and it just just turned this week it's starting to go and so it's not quite there. Another week, and it will be full glorious red. Just beautiful. It's a, it's a Prescott Blaze maple. It's just stunning. Uh, Ammer maple has turned color this week. Or the other name is Flame maple. It's kind of like a, it sort of reminds me of a Japanese maple. It's got a small maple leaf, small footprint, small format, Typically, it comes in a multi-stem format. So uh, Japanese maple typically come in a single trunk with a miniature tree form up to about 10, 12 feet. This one's typically a vase-shaped multi-stemmed red maple. The reason that flame maple is hardier or better or a better choice for the mountains of Arizona is that our elevation, the sun is pretty intense. 
And so it's too intense for most Japanese maples. This is hard for my southern folks to really understand. Japanese maple grows in full sun in uh, in Missouri. It does not do that here. It needs more protection, needs more shade. Well, a flame maple, which kind of has a similar look, it loves it just it the hotter the better. I mean, plant it out in full sun, surround it with asphalt. It's happy, happy, happy. And so it's and it's just turned a the most intense red of, of most of the maples. I mean, it's like fire engine red, add fairy dust to watch it glow. I mean, it is that kind of intense. Another one that's right behind that, this kind of a shrub, a, a taller shrub, gets up about head high or so, six, maybe seven feet, a little bit shorter than a flame maple, but burning bush, burning bush, or it's a euonymus, uh, is a botanical name, but burning bush is how we all reference it because it looks like the thing is on fire. It's fire red. I mean, it is glowing red. Right now, the, the stock we've got here in the nursery it's got kind of a purple hue. So it goes from, from dark, rich green to this purple hue. And then right before, right after that, it goes bright red. I mean, like the, the, the cord, like a red straw. It's that color. I mean, it's, it is bright, bright red. Uh, it's that color. And it is a very hardy plant for the mountains. It's a great time to plant. I would say this is your ideal time to plant because you can see the color you can see how hardy it's going to be it's going to keep rooting out through the fall and then after the after the foliage drops because these are all deciduous plants deciduous means it sheds their leaves and has bright fall color uh, evergreens are going to be or conifers or evergreens so that's kind of some some horticultural definitions there get those out of the way uh, but euonymus has this most interesting bark. It, it's not like a peeling bark. It's got these ribs up and down the stems that are striking. Uh, they're, they're beautiful to just cut off and bring in as a bundle. Uh, use them as a decoration uh, on the table for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Put a bow on them around them. It's just they're very, very unusual. It's, those are one of the plants when I had to get my certified nursery professional certification. Um, this is pretty intense. You got to know all your Latin names, be able to identify a plant by its with or without leaves. What well, they threw one of these, they threw a deciduous. I mean, no foliage on this plant, burning bush in this identification. Thing. You have 10 plants at ID. You go down, you got to give the Latin name and the botanical name and the, and the common name. It's going, okay, wow. Well, that's pretty tricky. I got, got them right. I passed. I am certified. I'm a professional. Uh, but they threw one of those, and I'll never forget going, I, I remember that bark. But it's very distinctive. Once you take a close-up look, you go, you'll never forget. But burning bush is one of those plants. I mean, every yard should have one for their fall color, and now's the time that you plant those. Typically, they'll be in a two- to five-gallon size plant. I should probably cover that, too. What sizes are best planted and when? Right now, if you're planting in the autumn season, now through the end of the year, through, through let's say New Year, it's better to plant a little bit larger root ball. That way, if we do happen to get bitter cold, all of a sudden and the ground freezes, bigger is better, more insulated, more roots. Uh, you'll get a larger root mass for next summer as well. Uh, you, you plant the smaller sizes, one gallons, four inch, the tiny sizes, they're, you're planting those typically in the spring of the year when they're actives waking up and actively growing. So now you're better off. I mean, this is this is your grandparents told you, oh no, you want the smaller, better. In fact, we'll, we'll just we'll cut a stick off, plant it. We'll watch it grow. We it's hardier that way. That's not correct planting technique for the mountains of Arizona. And here, you're really planting when it comes down to it a root. It's not about the size of the plant. It's how large is the root mass. The larger the root mass, the more success you're going to have. This is really important for you folks that are RVers. You love to travel. You've got grandkids. You just want to go see them. You're, you're busy. You love playing golf more than taking care of the yard. Uh, you love tennis or quilting or whatever. If you're busy and active, bigger is better because it, it's, it's, a, it's a deeper root. So it takes longer for that root mass to dry out. Uh, or moisture content, 
or to freeze a winter uh, con- winter freeze. So bigger is better uh, when it comes to plants. I would say right now, tremendous time to plant, but plant a little bit larger. And then remember to water through the winter. These plants, because you're planting now, it's going to grow maybe 6 to 12 inches of roots. Uh, those That soil around there can dry out. We can have a bone-dried winter. We can have a very moist winter. I recommend watering once you plant at least twice a month. If we get a heavy snow or heavy rain, you can cut one of those out. But at least one deep watering per month through winter to keep that plant healthy and those new root hairs moist, supple, and taking in the moisture. Our ground really doesn't freeze. I mean, I think uh, I think code for most of, let's say, Payson, Prescott, uh, a little bit lighter for Kingman, the lower elevations is 18 inches for water lines. This is The ground is not going to freeze. They're, they're convinced the ground doesn't freeze 18 inches down. Well, that's pretty easy to trench an 18-inch hole. You folks from Wisconsin, you're used to eight-foot frost lines. I mean, code is water lines are buried, sewer lines are buried, eight feet under the ground. I don't know how you do that. That's crazy. I mean, here it's very light. And we, I've never, I haven't seen a, more than a six, eight inch frost line ever. And then really most years it's one, maybe two inches of frost. You pick through it, plants right through it because it just doesn't, it, it thaws during the day, freezes at night. So if you water, keeps those plants, the, the roots supple and, and growing and keep going. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa here with the plants of the week in our yellow Echebecchia. We crossed a coneflower and black-eyed Susan and created an impressive new bloomer. Free-flowering daisy-like blooms are cheery and loves full sun. The three-inch flowers are bigger, showier, and longer-lasting through the heat of summer at just $14 while they last. You'll only find them at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love new summer bloomers, they love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week in our Goldfinger Potentia. A versatile knee-high shrub that charms with its cheery buttercup gold flowers. A truly hardy perennial that loves to bloom in the hot, dry spaces in the garden. With long fingers of fine foliage, it's an attention-getting foundation plant. Deer, javelina, rabbits, no problems. They don't like the flowers or the foliage in just $14. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love cheery summer shrubs, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Have you ever wondered what's inside a giant pumpkin? Well, you can find out. So November 3rd, that's next Saturday, We're going to open up a 440-pound pumpkin. We're going to cut it right open and see what's inside. There's some rumors that it's super slimy, spooky slimy. There's rumors that it's double-walled, like the walls are a foot thick, that it's all flesh and no seed. There's rumors that there's thousands of seed inside that are huge. And then there's rumors that there's just a few dozen. And so we're going to open this baby up. It's looking good. If you want to come see the pumpkin, it's a beautiful specimen on display right in front of the parking lot here at Waters Garden Center. Uh, But we're promoting if every person that comes will get a seed, they could dry out and then harvest and then then grow next summer. So that's more of a summer plant. Doesn't like frost. So you plant those typically first week in May, maybe the last week in April, depending on where you're at. This vine, mine grew several vines at least 15 feet long. Maybe it's just, this is a monstrous plant. It's got to give it some space. It's going to take every bit of 10 by 10 space for one seed. And then it grows one to two giant pumpkins uh, that you harvest, which it's just fun. I mean, it's just fun. If you want to impress kids, oh, go, go pick a giant pumpkin. But that's November 3rd here at Waters Garden Center at 11 o'clock in the morning. It's going to be right on the money, 11 o'clock. 
come in, gather in the parking lot or that front patio underneath the greenhouse. I'm not sure how I'm going to cut it open yet. I'm going to call some friends going, hey, how do you, how do you slice one of these? I've got a sword. I've got a sawzall. And I've got a chainsaw. We'll see which one works best. So we'll, we'll try the saws I'm thinking. I just don't want to, I don't want to hurt any seed. Every person that comes gets a seed just for coming. You get to touch and feel. If it's really hollow, we'll let you take, jump inside and take pictures. I don't know. Uh, and then we'll harvest the seed, give those away. And then whatever's left over, we're going to grow those as next year's crop of giant pumpkins. Uh, that'll probably be available. You know, I'm guessing the last week of April, I'll probably I'll try to set the grow calendar up for that and then pulsate maybe 50 different pumpkins every week through May. So we'll see how many seed are in there. I just don't know. So it'll be interesting. You're, you're invited. It's a free event. It's just bring the kids. It'll be an Instagram dream. Just take pictures and have fun, uh, and we're, we're going to do the same. Maybe it'll take 30 minutes. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see how gooey it is and what's inside. I've never cut a, a pumpkin this size open before. This is the size where you cut it open, and make boats. You float them down, you know, Watson Lake. It's that kind of size. And then, uh, you know, Lisa mentioned our Ponderosa Circle. Uh, this is our best customers, our core, inner core. Those folks we see regularly every week. They're just, there's some customers in a small business that are really special. And so they were invited to this Ponderosa Circle. At that event, I, I, at any major event, I always have a nonprofit that I promote because I think it's not about the money, especially in a small town. I mean, Waters Garden Center, we're not about the money. I would have kept being a corporate banker. I was worked for big, big credit. I was a director of marketing for Equifax and TransUnion, big, big companies. But I missed my small town, the influence of family. I wanted to come home. And so I came back. And so this is this our company's been uh, it started in 1962 57 years it's way more than just a money this is legacy and community and neighbors and friendships and people you see at church and at the grocery store and on the soccer field this is this is what small business is well a friend of mine is is started or helped promote freewheelchairmission.org freewheelchairmission they're not going to have a gala this year they're raising money uh, to put folks in third world countries in wheelchairs. People are crawling in the dust. They don't even have access to wheelchairs. They make these things out of bicycle parts. So they're easy to fix. They can put a chair into each person's hand for about 80 bucks, and they're raising money. If you need a place to donate, these are people that are us in northern Arizona. They're raising money, and then they go deliver the chairs themselves. It's called freewheelchairmission.org. Great organizations, 100% charitable it's a good way to end the end of the year. But that's it for this show. Until next week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. Come say hi. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Gardening has always come natural to me. Green thumbs, they just run in the family. So when the Family Garden Center was offered to Lisa and I, we jumped on the opportunity. I've always loved coming to the nursery, being surrounded by all the beauty, helping the backyard gardener and passing on some of that natural magic that happens so easily for me. We aren't just selling plants, we're offering garden success. My name is Ken Lane, owner, and you'll feel the magic here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.